So you're seeing the recording. Uh, okay, well, Bob, uh, it's good to see you here, and um, thank you very much to uh, Yanir uh, from uh, Nexi for uh, hosting this uh, little conversation. But one of the things I've been interested in, Bob, is is the notion of complexity in healthcare systems and information technology in general. And one of the things that really impressed me with your work in uh, the spreadsheet, I've been quoting this for 20 years, by the way, we've only known each other for 10, but the, the notion of building a system of tools, one level of abstraction below the user levels of abstraction. But um, so anyway, I've been quoting the spreadsheet as an example of software tools as a way of coping with complexity. So anyway, that's that's just one theme here. But I thought we just had a little well, conversation well, it, it, on this. And, uh, it, it, it's an interesting thought because, I mean, what I've been saying is that complexity is not a property of the system; it's a property of the, of the observer. And I mean, if you look at mathematically, if you look at complexity of all these states, it's the observer who decides what states are valid. The system itself can't know that. Are we allowed to disagree? Yes. This is John here talking. Go ahead, off camera. Off camera. So. Um, let me just say that I disagree I mean, when you measure the entropy of a system. The entropy of a system is a physically meaningful quantity that yes. describes the system. And our understanding of complexity is that it's a similar measure of the phase space available to the system at different scales of observation. But the, the way it answers... So then it becomes, in fact, the property of the system and not the property of the observer. Okay, well, here's the question is, how are you defining the system? And I'm, I'm arguing the definition of the system is an observation. In other words, otherwise, all states are really likely. I, that I agree with. That you, have, you can choose, no, well, not necessarily. In other words, the, the, once you've defined the boundaries of the system, which you have choice about, then the states that the system presents to you are not your... Uh, but mathematically, uh, in a sense, all the states are equally unlikely. No, only in only in a system which is in equilibrium. Okay, let, let me see if I can approach it a little differently. So, if the, the way evolution defeats entropy is to declare more states valid, in other words, it's not declaring it defeats it does not defeat the physics of the system. In the sense that, you know. If I look at a state, that state's unlikely. In other words, you're not, if you run it again, it's not going to repeat the same thing. It's not going to come back to the same state. But if I say any, the more states that I, I accept as valid, the more, the, the better the evolutionary process works. Again, I mean, I'm not sure that I see the same uh, statement. I mean, there's something to what you say. I'm not saying that it's wrong, mm -hmm. but I would articulate it very differently. I think selection affects which selection, by definition, affects which states you see. It, and it, therefore, it affects, by definition, the probability of the system across the set of possible states. No, it, it does. But the, but the, diff the question is... Um, Sort of when you measure measures of success, and the wider you measure of success, the the more likely you'll have success. Right. But biology has its own definition of success. It, one of the principles of biology is that you don't specify the success; the system specifies success based upon replication. Right. And so right. That's the fitness well, well, function of evolution. That's the fitness function of evolution. That may not be. How you want to define success, and I agree with you that that's not necessarily. Uh, but I think we're crossing levels here because no. we're talking physics and biology. No, but I'm, I'm, but I'm, no, I'm accepting this in the sense that I'm saying the problem is the fitness function is unknowable because it depends on all, on a lot of external factors. So you can't know what you measure. In other words, but it's not your responsibility. The question of of your ability to predict. Is not the same as measuring the space of possible states. Oh, uh, and, and what I'm saying is, and this is why I'm trying to find approaches that don't depend on predicting. In other words, what the goals are. So we have this conflict. People want to make predictions, and nature doesn't care because oh, its only measure of success is persistence. It's not even reproduction. I mean, 
there's reproduction as a mechanism, but ultimately, unless you assume this sort of intelligent design to say it's got to go this way, there's no guarantee. At some point, evolution can work perfectly to create this great creatures you like, and then a big rock hits the planet. Well, nature is very willing to sacrifice the individual. Well, it's more than it's sacrificing the individual. I mean, you hit you hit the planet with a big rock, and you get a reset. Right. Now, how does that fit into the evolutionary story? I mean, there, it's it's a major external factor in this particular system. The larger system, it's sort of like if you have two ponds, and one actually sort of, through erosion, gets down to a layer of some toxic chemicals and everything dies there. You have all these external factors, but as long as you have enough ponds, mm -hmm. the system as a whole persists. Well, that's okay. well, let's, can I jump in here? We have three, th three threads here. One is complexity in general and, and the relationship between physics and chemistry. And then the topic that I wanted to talk about was the spreadsheet and complexity. Well, okay, let for me now, back and then we can move well, move into. Why don't you go back to central problem? No, but yeah. the, the, but this is all relevant because my major theme is you've got two different forces. You've got the bottom up forces, the system states and everything, but you've also got the external co coming in. And the example I use in the solar system is Ptolemy versus Copernicus. One one had a simple system, one had a complex system, but they're talking about the same thing. So the thing where the spreadsheet becomes interesting. And the reason the spreadsheet is so powerful is it did essentially nothing. The power comes by what it does not do. That is basically a blank sheet of paper. It did have this little trick of recalculating, but it basically you bring the meaning and knowledge to it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what you're doing, you'll still get very pretty results. And probably in most cases, that's what happened. They'll be very pretty. But the meaning was so. We never, one of the things I did not put in was significance of tracking for two reasons. Number one, I knew most people didn't want to know the results were meaningless, even though they were. I mean, how many financial projections have you seen where it goes out 10 years and it's 1% difference right. after, you know, it's meaningful. And the other problem is often the numbers coming in are such big guesstimates, it's a Bayesian problem, that it's, I mean, these are meaningless. So this is why in companies you invest in the people. Mm -hmm. And you say, and one of the skills, apparently, is the ability to create fake spreadsheets. Well, but when you say significance tracking, is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, well, so kind of a fuzzy set, uh, certainty factor per, per number, is that what you're saying? But the problem, and, well, the problem is, you, you, those are all attempts to get hard numbers out of guesstimates. And one of the examples is like when we did, my first career was in the financial world, yeah. providing the, the data. And that, it, it, once you're through that, you understand how meaningless the data is. And like the Black Scholes numbers, I was just speaking to uh, last night to actually one of the people who's running Fidelity. And the fact that people don't understand the purpose of the Black Scholes numbers was to allow us to give you a single number, which is the value of your portfolio. It had no real predictive value. But then people imbued it with all this meaning and knowledge and said, if we can only calculate this, we can hedge this, we can do this, we can get meaning out of it. And, you know, the question is, the mystery is why the financial system works at all given such reasoning. And there's a good book, um, one of which is called Debt, which is about, basically the point it makes it very simple. We never had a barter system as the basis for economics because that doesn't scale. So you had a system of loose mutual obligations, which has problems scaling, and that's why we created the monetary system, but it's a very imperfect mapping. So we have a lot, so a lot of systems going back to the spreadsheet then. It works because people also do reality check, because the result makes sense. Or I'll use the result, but verify it, and then adjust. So there's some value in giving you some, sometimes the numbers are meaningful. I'm not saying that they're never meaningful. Is but, this what you're for, Tom? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we're talking healthcare mostly, and most healthcare people aren't familiar with Black Scholes. What how that does relate to healthcare, though, is this idea of you can reduce this complex thing to a single scalar value, and then make decisions on it. Uh, right. And, and, and the answer is, it, it sort of allows you to make decisions. Well, the decision well, making is another question. Yeah, but the the, the whole idea, of, and this gets into the, the normal distribution, medicine by bell curve. Is this was one bell curve when you have these scalar values, and everybody is a deviation from the mean but, but, according to that scalar but value? That, but then my experience, including the decision making group, I mean, back 40 years ago, 
is Bayesian analysis assumes that these numbers are meaningful in displays calculation. Right. In practice, you re and this is where the best lesson may be Google and things like language recognition, handwriting, which turns out they just do hell with understanding it. Yeah. Let's just go statistics and just look for patterns. Yeah. And and forget meaning. Now, I don't it's an extreme, I think you need something in the middle because when you can find patterns like Copernicus versus Ptolemy. I mean, even Ptolemy found patterns. It was, the math was right. Yeah. It was just too cumbersome to work with. But the planets didn't need to know F equals M A to orbit, right? Maybe and people don't need to know health care to stay alive. Matter of fact, uh, well, well, for many, staying away from the doctor is over the healthiest well, thing they can do. back to the things <laughs> left out of the spreadsheet. The things that don't happen in healthcare are often the most important. But back to the spreadsheet oh, but the itself, great term, yeah. There's a term, iatrogenic, and there's another one. There's, there's Latin, two Latin words. One is, uh, the, I don't know the cause, and the other is yeah. the doctor cause. Yeah. But they sound so good that we fold it into healthcare and think that it represents understanding. And there's a profit motive of the atrogenic uh, stuff. Uh, and, you know, well, but, if you get penicillin, it makes people happy. Okay. If you give them a placebo, it makes them happy. Back, to the, spreadsheet, more complicated stuff. Back to the spreadsheet okay. and the software architecture about building a tool set for people to use that is uh, one level of abstraction below what they need to do. So, it, 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 was, uh, it was not a level of abstraction below. Well, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter what you design. I'm telling you what I saw. No, okay? I understand. But, so, uh, yeah. Okay, you're a travel clerk, and you want to do a travel reports. Okay, I want to do this and this, but I want to divide this by uh, regions within the company and cut it this way and divide it by that and, and multiply it by the management level and do my own thing. You had no idea that that was being done with your spreadsheet. You were building a set of tools that gave that travel clerk the ability no, I, to do I, their I, own I, thing. Well, and it give you many other extremes. In examples. contrast to someone telling a systems analyst to write a COBOL program to say, well, what regions, and we'll hard code the region table, what what uh, management codes will do this, and tell us exactly what you, how you want to multiply. But, well, so uh, that's what the spreadsheet uh, uh, did, is it enabled people through the set of tools to do this. Yes. Which is different than giving them a bunch of APIs. No, no, I, 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 well. Something just occurred to me, because, you know, there was a spreadsheet when I worked in the early days in order processing systems. And I'm almost thinking is giving somebody their own prescription pad. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, by the way, you know, Dan Berkman did website, the Declan processor. Yeah. Original. So, a lot, and, uh, the the difference, and this goes back to the whole set of questions, how much knowledge the system have versus you have. Mm -hmm. The spreadsheets did not make up for your lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They leveraged your knowledge. But they leveraged it in a relatively generic way. Now, we did build an NPD and a few tools like that, but later you could do that yourself. That was just a workaround. Uh, so the, a lot of the stuff is... It, it's. You can have the, there's a difference between a blank pad and a blank prescription pad. Okay. Right. And so the, but the question is how much knowledge you put in, but how much do you repurpose it? So people would use the spreadsheet like for in outboards, but it was the only tool they had. It wasn't necessarily the best tool, the tool that gave them the most leverage, but it didn't prevent you from, from using it in another way. The danger came when you assume that the spreadsheet, it's sort of the Furby problem. I don't know how many of you remember the Furby, the toy. That the, yeah, yeah. Okay. But what, what's the problem? The problem with the Furby. Okay, so I learned a lot about the architecture of the Furby. There's one thing I go to, Dave Hampton, the designer, gave, comes to me and gave a long talk. And basically, people project all sorts of behavior and meaning onto the Furby that doesn't exist. Even to the point the military didn't want to bring the Furby in because they thought it would be recording and spying on I see. Okay. It had essentially, you know, just a few bits of state. It's a very clever design, but it gave the illusion. And a lot of Eliza. Well, Eliza's a whole. And Joe Weisenbaum wanted to disprove AI. Instead, he disproved NI. NI. The natural intelligence. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, Weisenbaum is another interesting. Case. <laughs> but, but, but getting back to the spreadsheet, tool, people would dangerous spreadsheets. People would then put their knowledge into spreadsheets. And forget it was their knowledge, and then take it as an oracle. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like any tool; you can use it one way or the other. Well, it's, you know, it, the it, printing it works press. For them, it, like, well, but, it, it, but, but that's what I mean by works. Well, what I mean is, uh, 
<laughs> so, so we have to explain what the crisis is that we're trying to address. Yes. So well, the, the crisis. The point Bob, I think, is making, and correct me if I'm wrong with this, um, is that it is possible to set up a system to extract some number, and then you can base your decision making on that number. It gives you a process by which you make the decision. However, that doesn't mean that you're making the right decision. What if you the only right? time that you know that you're making the right decision, if the process, I mean, let's say you created a random box, mm -hmm. it just sort of randomly outputs numbers based upon the input data. That has nothing to do with the input data at all. It just puts out a random number. The only time that you know that you're actually making a mistake is that eventually the outcomes of whatever your decision making is not better than some other outcome. Now, the point is the following, that if you have a complex system, then it may be hard for you to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, the fact that you have some brand of decisions being made uh, is not apparent for a long time until or, or there's sufficient data or whatever. So the question then becomes, is in fact, tool that one creates equivalent to just a random decision making process or does it improve it in some way beyond it? Well that that we get a very good philosophical question on time scales and, yeah. and all this. But I, I, the point I'm making is these tools are all useful, you know, and everything. But but let's not confuse the first one of the way we deal with this problem is reiterate. Or trust but verify. Mm -hmm. So you, so the key thing is you have to be checking back against reality. Now the system gets too complex. The we question is, what are you well, checking? No, I'm saying so. I'm saying the system is too complex. We might not have any real simple way to check back with reality. But it, but let me just jump up a level because this is really big back to something. I'd else. like to get back to the 1978 spreadsheet level sometime too. So okay, I'll get back to that. I just want to make okay. a point. Okay. I mean, I've been thinking about that because. Uh, the, the chapter I wrote in 97 about where do you get Moore's law hypergrowth made me think about a lot of this. Like one observation is when you have the bell curve, it means you throw away all the useful information. Or, you know, and it was this, again, the paper I explained where, how I came to some of these things and why the learning curve is an illusion. You only get the learning curve when you throw away all the useful information. So the question is how do systems work anyway? And the conclusion there in terms of hypergrowth was when you accept when you broaden your definition of success, you don't demand the one answer. And so a source, of, you know, so when the system is too complex, trying to solve it is essentially hopeless. You look for a different approach for what you're trying to achieve, where you can iterate. You need a completely different, you know, if, as long as you, if you use the metrics of healthcare, you're really stuck. And one question is, is there a different approach where you would love to give people or an individual initiative? Well, that's exactly the point in healthcare. And the the issue of metrics is, is a huge topic. And is there a, a way, I mean, does reducing healthcare to a skater of value to put in a, mel, uh, a bell curve reasonable? But, but back to the original, again, 1978 decision to, to do the spreadsheet in an era when uh, there was a lot of hard coding of applications. So uh, back to the well, expense report. Uh, okay, you tell an analyst, they'll write the expense report for you, and we'll give you this finished product that does this one thing right, but, as opposed to giving people a tool set. But, okay, so... And, to, to, uh, but it's, it's not unlike the word processor. People can write really bad books with a word processor. But, that's not the issue no, about a word processor. I, I, I understand, and I think a lot of... You see, a lot of it's building tools for myself and things like that. So, you know, uh, uh, I had a long tradition of sort of... So, so I have a question, if I can. Yeah. Can you describe what was the original innovation? Okay. And so let me give you a bit of background. First, it was Dan. If you call Dan up, and he's if he's available, I can have him come down. He's, he's, on the he's lips, happy to you know, right nearby. This is Dan but, Bricklin. Huh? Yeah. Yes. But the... <laughs> Basic. So, okay, we're restarting. Okay. okay, so like I've worked on this first financial language where people 
could put in numbers. And with in other words, a lot of these tools we had within constraint to do time shares analysis, to pull in data, to do multiply so they could do so there are a lot of, and, and, and in word processing was Emacs, mm -hmm. uh, which it worked on. Uh, so we were used to that. So it basically the, the, the uh, uh, one thing I should learn is never give numbers because the number points. But one point uh, is, you know, so we've been used to sort of tools to solve. So when Dan found himself in business school, having to recalculate the spreadsheets, that would seem absurd. This is what computers should be doing. So that was sort of a key thing, of, you know, because we had the, if you had the right background, of course the computer should do this. Uh, but the other big thing was when we originally talked about it, you know, if you remember back in those days, uh, I mean, I read the history of computers. It's amazing how many ideas in that period of 20 years before had sort of all come together. So we were used to heads-up displays where you look at the screen and the graphics. So the real insight was, was the grid. By having the grid, you could say that. You, you did, because it was, we constrained to the grid, it basically uh, sort of reduced the degrees of freedom. So now I can point to that. And you didn't have to organize it yourself. So for a set of problems with fit within the grid model, and, and being an unconscious, unlike time series where you had regular grids, we didn't, you could, we, we, we think, you know, did replicate, which has now been improved on, but the original replicate was a way to get time series like results. But exceptions weren't exceptions. You just made whatever changes you want. So that uh, that was, I think, the key part of it in terms of finding the right constraints. So uh, the grid, in fact, is kind of like a surface layer to all the complexity of the API type well, stuff was that, underneath well, it. There was no complexity. It was just it calculus. I mean, one of the things I remember when, when figuring it out was... Um, had to do it. The other big constraint was I wanted to fit in 16K bytes. Right. <laughs> now, it wound up using 32, which I'm embarrassed by, but you know, that was expensive memory in those days. Uh, but it forced me, so the, obviously, I was, we were used to Lisp and things like that. You know, those are all standard stuff been used for years. So, obviously, the way to do numbers was you store the, the, the calculations and you were pointing at linked lists. But I didn't have space for anything so fancy. So they figured, you know, we don't have to do any of this order of recalc. We'll just go across rows and down columns. And if, if it doesn't work, that's, that's the user's problem. So, so here is the, the, the connection that you were making, I think. Mm -hmm. I would like to expose a little. First of all, you were aware of visualization. All right. You were concerned about looking at what you were doing. And Dan Brickle especially. So that the nature of having things in front of you, as opposed to hidden in some computer code, is a key issue in the spreadsheet. Yeah, and matter of fact, one part of visualization which we didn't like is that you didn't always see, we, had, we wanted a moment where you can see the equation themselves, but it really could illustrate the relationships. So that was a risk if you have a little complex, you lose control of that. But in simple enough spreadsheets, you, if you deconstruct, and this is where I haven't really stated this, but it's a good point. The best spreadsheets are the ones where it's obvious what the relationships are. Bad spreadsheets have all sorts of implicit complex relationships, and there you lose control. Right. But given the ability to see the numbers yes. in front of you and to change equations and to see the effect of the change, or to change numbers and to see the effect, you all of a sudden had an interactive way to see, visualize what you were looking at. And quickly. And quickly. And it was passing that out to the user to do, not not a techie program. Well, well I, I wrote a, a thing a while back basically saying programs are a problem. They're, they're the problem, not the solution. Because what is a programmer uh, other than a translator? Uh, and You know, the ideal goal is you work, in, and this goes back to when it's taking, realizing why Chomsky was wrong, mm -hmm. when it's taking... Uh, a, a psycholinguistics. This is back in the language wars at MIT. 
Can we go to this? This actually, was spreadsheets this actually comes yeah, back to spreadsheets. Yeah, okay. 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 The thing I realized is deep structure didn't make any sense. You had to understand and hear things at the semantic level of conversation. Which is a surface structure. That's what you did with the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet no, was a surface structure to no, a deeply it, complex... No, no it's after the opposite of saying there's no deep complex underneath. Right. That you had to work in the semantics of the surface structure. Right. And that it was a deep complex that lost the essential ambiguity which made it work. There's one other thing that I would say. The way I like to think about the spreadsheet is not in terms of programming, but actually in terms of calculus. So, if you have a calculator, a calculator is a very powerful tool. Yes. Now, what happens if you take the calculator and you replicate it in space? And, and allow recalculation. And you allow recalculation, and you allow the kinds of relationships that are, you know, I can calculate on the basis of what's in another calculator. Yes. All of a sudden, you have a template, which is what you but, well, I think well, well, you mentioned the word space. I think that's a critical issue. He did create a space. The spreadsheet the created a space. space. It's yeah, the so there's a space. space for this to embed within. Well, if you had it in three dimensions, it wouldn't be as useful. Right. Uh, yes. If you had it in one dimension, it wouldn't be as useful. But he created this surface space it's, that people could see. It, and it, it, you know, but the important point he is making, again, this goes back to the semantics where the user said, yes, I want to do 3D spreadsheets and all that. But the key thing was that it was understandable to the user, exactly. and right. and it was programming, programming in a way that's meaningful. Right. And yeah. uh, the one thing when they gave the original physical paper, I pointed out that there was a problem with the phone system in the thirties. That they talking about the nineteen fifties, everybody in the country would have to become a phone operator. Right. And the way they solved it was they made it easy to become a phone operator by putting the dial on. So people didn't think they're operating the phone system, yeah. but in fact, they were doing the switchboard operator's work. Yeah. So a lot of this and the challenge, and this is where, it, 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 it's a huge luck factor. I mean, this is a, we, we had no idea sort of that we were getting this sort of perfect point. Of, where word processors don't have this characteristic. They're not as highly leveraged. They're not used to finance the industry and iterate. Yeah. So, and this, Wolfram gave this talk at the conference of how do you know what the mathematical constructs are good or not? And the answer was you just have to explore. It's drug discovery. We try, we, they think about drug discovery. Sure, we can do all the models. and the ultimate, you just cycle through like this is where there was one, one thing that was funny with using nematodes I think, to test out drugs. I think, I think, Tom, you're looking for deeper meaning. And there, <laughs> well, what Bob is telling you is that they were exploring the confluence of a set of ideas. Right. And what they ended up with and turned out to be a sweet spot in terms of yeah. what was needed for people to right. be able to visualize and yet program and understand, understand what it was that was the connection between program and the results of it. Or, or, or yeah. not even the, you're right, not even the program. Oh. Their, their description. And the program is a description. It's an output. And this is one thing, go back to HTML. And this is, you always move between descriptive and programmatic. And, the, and this, one thing in programming was the go-to. The yeah. reason, and Dijkstra really didn't get it, because he was just looking at it mathematically and purity. No, it's, Pro, go to is about psychology. Go to without the go to with structure constructs, the static form of programming gave you a sense of what the dynamic form would do. With the go to, you couldn't do that. So it's all a matter of trying to reduce the complexity to be descriptive, whereas programmatic, it's very hard. There, you don't have the constraints that allow you to understand the system. You could look at it and figure out the rules. But descriptive, like with HTML, especially XHTML, you, you, you can have more understanding. It doesn't mean you always do. You can always make things too complicated, but you have a fighting chance of understanding. Let me, let me follow up on what Yanir said. Uh, appreciate your saying that, Bob. Uh, the, my, Bob and I, by the way, were in similar orbits back in the time he was a busy calc. I was doing uh, similar PC work, and then I went into the VA. But I started this... Uh, 
at the VA to work on a system called the VISTA today, an electronic health record system. And many of the same concepts that we're talking about, of both semantics and the surface level, and the programmer and the complexity, um, I, I reinterpreted in the world of VISTA. So I was trying to build a toolkit, mm -hmm. one level of abstraction below the doctor's level. We're trying to give them tools for the doctor to express himself. And again, at the same semantic level. Now, it wasn't nearly as elegant as a spreadsheet in terms of simplicity, but it was a much more complicated domain. But the, the, the same idea is about building a, a tool set for the clinicians to use to express themselves. Uh, and I had this whole idea of conceptual integrity. We started out with a, a metadata dictionary of the database and the users. So everybody had a common infrastructure to work from. And then we expressed the surface of it, which at the time was a very klutzy roll and scroll terminal mode in you know, 1982. But, um, but that worked, and it was a successful tool for, for its time. But the, the, the same arguments about tools and semantics and creating a, a representational space for a complex system is, is what I was working on in Vista. And I, and, okay, next question is where do you go in the future, the semantics of the future, and dealing with medical information at a semantic level, which is a topic for Joanne and her work with uh, um, RDF and OWL on the semantics of biopathways, expressing life sciences as a semantic web type thing where you're actually dealing directly at the semantic level rather than at all the finite state interfaces of all the pieces. So one thing that's critical is context. Context. Well, uh, and, and I think, yeah, this goes back, I mean, and ambiguity. The problem. This is a good place to switch. To switch. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's, uh,